Okay, welcome to the 74th lecture in the Otara University of Commerce English lecture series. And today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Tasker. She is from Hokudai, Hokkaido University. And today she's, uh, she is an astrophysicist, I should say that. And today she'll be uh, talking to us uh, about this topic, From Galaxies to Planets, the Universe in Your Computer. Please welcome Dr. Elizabeth Tasker. Very much. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the research that's done at our group. So, thank you very much for the introduction, Sean. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Tasker, and I'm an assistant professor in physics, or more specifically in cosmo sciences, at Hokkaido. And you, you really all know where this is, so this map is unnecessary. So I'm going to start by introducing like, what actually are computer simulations in astrophysics, and then go on to discuss why we even need them. Well, when you think about astronomy, you might have different ideas in mind about what it really is. But in fact, if you were to start a career in astronomy, you have three different choices. So choice one is observation. This is what most people think about when they think of astronomy and astrophysics. It involves a telescope. Now, in reality, uh, we tend not to use telescopes of this size so much as these kind of telescopes. These are two twin telescopes called the Keck. They're on Hawaii, uh, and so they look at the northern hemisphere of the sky. And when you do observations like this, you end up with you know, data like this on whatever object you're looking at, be it galaxy or a star or a planet. So this is choice one. But choice two is instead of observation, you can do instrumentation. By which I mean, rather than look through the telescopes, you could actually be the one building them. So, for example, this is Canary Cam. It is an infrared camera that is attached to a telescope in the Canary Isles. And this is Professor Charles Telesco. He is at the University of Florida. And Florida actually have a very big instrumentation program. And they build instruments for many telescopes around the world. So, observation, instrumentation, what's our third choice? Our third choice is theory. And this can mean either computer modeling or analytical theory, which is more pen and paper calculations. If you do computer modeling, you might end up with a data set like that, which while not immediately recognizable, does actually show you the structure of the universe. And we run these kind of models in supercomputers, so that doesn't really mean a computer like this, it means more a system like this. So this is the supercomputer down in Tokyo, it's where I run a lot of my final simulations after doing smaller tests on local machines. So for astronomy, these are our three choices. But today, we're actually going to ignore the first two entirely and pretend that all astronomy is theory, because that is my work. So why should we use computer simulations in astronomy? Why are they even important when we have bigger and better telescopes every single year? Well, we have a few problems in astronomy that are very specific to astronomy itself and don't apply to many other areas of science. So problem one is that we are stuck on the Earth. So astronomers only have one view of the universe so this means I'd be like looking at you all further on and wondering what the back of a head looks like. So for example, in the moon, we only ever see one side of the moon and we never see the other side. Now the moon is relatively close. And since the Apollo 8 mission, we have actually been able to send people to go and check out the other side. But most objects that we're interested in are simply not that close. Nearby stars and galaxies, we just can't go and send a spaceship to and find out what they look like from different angles. Instead, we're stuck looking at them from only one position 
and trying to understand how they're made and how they evolve. So problem number two, which is also very particular to astronomy, is you cannot put a star in a laboratory and examine it. So things that we're interested in, stars, planets, and galaxies, are a bit too big to just pick up, put on the table, and cut in half. So we have to take a guess about what's inside them. And this is where computer models really come into their own. Because through a computer model, we can turn things around, we can cut them open, we can make estimates of what they're like in areas we cannot see. The other problem we have is that the universe can move in three directions. Obviously, right? I can move this way, I can move this way, and I can move up. And so I have three position coordinates, x, y, z. I also have three velocity coordinates, because I have my speed in this direction, my speed in that direction, and when I jump, my speed upwards. But when you're observing, everything is flattened against the sky. This means if you're an observer, you only have two position coordinates, one this way and one that way. And you typically have only one velocity coordinate that comes straight at you. We can measure the velocity in this direction, but things are so far away that we can't normally see them move in this direction. So we end up with being able to see the declination and the right ascension, which are our two directions mapped on the sky plane, and one velocity. So we've gone from six coordinates to three. So we've lost quite a lot of information. But with a computer, we can see the universe from different directions and also at different times. So we can take an object like our own star or our own galaxy, and if we build a computer model, we can look at what it looked like when it was born and what it might look like in another billion years from now. And this way we can understand how these systems were put together and what our own fate is on our own planet. So another very big advantage involves physics. So when we deal with the physics of the universe, it's really like having a giant toy box. So we have different processes that can go on in the universe. Like, for instance, there's a lot of gas in the galaxy. The gas collapses to form stars. There's also gravity. That collapse happens because of the gravity. But there's also heat. Stars are giving off heat. Dust is giving off heat. There's magnetic fields. There's winds from stars. There's star death. Stars can explode in something called a supernova, which gives a huge amount of energy back to the gas. So one question we might have is, which of these is the most important? When you look at the universe, they're all going on. You can't separate them out to say, aha, in this area, gravity is the most important process. This is gravity's role, whereas in this particular area, magnetic fields are playing the bigger part. It's very hard to do that with observations because everything is happening at once. So how do you know what is controlling what? But with a computer simulation, we can do some really crazy stuff and just turn off physics we're not interested in. So we can make a simulation in which there was a whole universe constructed with only gravity, gas, and heat, and leave all the other physics alone in the toy box. Or alternatively, we could try a different universe entirely and say, what would the universe look like if it had gas, winds, and magnetic fields, but no gravity? And by comparing what the result is, we can say, ah, this is the most important role for gravity, this is what gas affects, this is what magnetic fields affect, and understand the role they're playing. So it's a little like using, uh, walking into a very big company. Supposing you're suddenly promoted to the top, and you go into this company and there are people everywhere. How do you know who's doing what? Well, 
obviously in that situation you talk to people and you get hang of your job. But with simulation, you can basically just remove the people and see what happens. And then you find out what job they were doing. So as an example, we could ask, what about dust heating? The galaxy turns out to be packed full of dust. And this can give out a lot of heat. But is it important? Does it matter for star formation? Let's take a look. So I'm going to show you a simulation that is only one quarter of this galaxy disk. And this is what it looks like without any heat. What you're looking at is gas density. So there's very little gas out here, and in these red going yellow spots, there's a lot of gas packed very closely into a stored area. Now if I turn on dust heating, we see quite a different pattern in the, in the dust. In particular, we see less red areas. So there's less dense collections of gas when we have this dust heating. So what we found is that this heat changes the disk structure. And it turns out to start affecting star formation, because star formation needs dense gas. So here we've got less red areas, we've got less dense gas, therefore we have slightly less star formation. I hope I've convinced you that simulations are absolutely necessary for astronomy. Let's go through some of the projects that our group has been working on after I take some board. So let's uh, begin with a bit of background. How does a star live? What is its lifetime? So going from birth to adolescence to adulthood and then to death. So stars are born in cold clouds of gas. That red that I showed you on the image is actually very cold and it's very dense. And in the middle of there, we're going to get some stars. So we have these very cold clouds. And somewhere in there, we're going to end up with a particularly dense region. And gravity is going to push down on that to make a dense ball. And once it gets dense enough, we start off nuclear fusion, and that star begins to shine. And finally, it depends slightly on the star mass, but a star like our sun will probably explode near the end of its life in something we call a supernova. For the record, not going to happen for a while. We don't need to worry about it quite yet. <laughs> So this means these clouds in which stars are born are pretty important. Their properties, like their mass and their temperature and how big they are, are going to determine how many stars they birth. So really, it is these gaseous stellar nurseries that are controlling our galaxy star formation rate. So we need to understand how and why they form in order to understand when a star like our sun is going to be born. So, take home message, clouds are important. So, this is Yusuke Fujimoto. He is my PhD student, and he'll be graduating next year. And he's probably really regretting pulling that face when I took a camera. <laughs> and what Yusuke has been looking at is why do we see spiral arms? Now, this galaxy is M51. And you can see pretty stunning spiral arms in this disk. Now, the Milky Way is thought to have a similar structure. But why do we see them? Well, maybe the answer is very obvious. If there are more stars in the spiral, they're going to be more visible because we see the starlight. So, is it just that simple? Well, there are more stars in the spiral, therefore, we see the spiral structure. But you can take it one step further and ask, why are there more stars forming in this spiral arm? So let's just draw your clouds in and look at the possibilities. So possibility one for why there are more stars in the spiral is very simple. The spiral contains more of these gas cloud star nurseries. So we very simply have the star formation is proportional to fuel. 
we've got more gas to make stars, therefore we get more stars. So that's option one. Option two is that the spiral contains more clouds, but that alone is not enough. What is important is that these clouds are interacting. They're banging together and the gas is being stirred up. And this kind of moving and shaking is what's needed to create stars. So yes, the spiral contains more clouds, but the key is these clouds have to keep hitting each other. And that is key for star formation. That's option two. Option three is that actually there is something different about these clouds. The ones that are in the spiral, as opposed to other areas of the galaxy, are fundamentally different beasts. They're different types of star and nursery. And that these guys are just a lot better at making star babies than these. So these kind of questions and these three possibilities, I think are very similar to asking this question. Why is there a higher birth rate in the cities than in the country? So the cities are our spiral arm, and the country is like the area in between the spiral. So in this analogy, possibility one is that there are more people in the cities than in the country, where you just have a few people and a lot of sheep. <laughs> And people are proportional to babies. You have more people, therefore you have a greater number of small, very annoying children. So, possibility two is that people are not enough because we don't just split in half and produce a baby. The secret is the cities hold more parties. And in parties, people meet. And people need to meet to have babies. <laughs> so the first option is, it's enough just to have the people. The second option is, it's no good if they're just living in their own apartments. The key is, there's a lot of parties happening. People are meeting, and they're getting pregnant. Now option three, is that city and country people aren't really the same type of people at all. And the city people just fall pregnant much more easily. Whereas country people, uh, yeah, not so much. So anyone familiar with the Big Bang Theory? This is uh, Howard Wolowitz, and he has terrible chat-up lines. For instance, are you Google? Because you're everything I'm searching for. And due to these terrible chat-up lines, Howard has a problem finding a girlfriend. So if country people were like Howard, there probably would be less babies in the country. So how do we determine which of these three options is the most important for stars in our galaxy? Well, let's make a plan. So the plan is create a computer simulation of a galaxy. And then we're going to compare the clouds in the spiral arm to those in the outer regions. And we're going to see, are they really different? Is this popular person versus Howard Wolowitz? Are they just interacting more? Or is it simply a matter that numbers are important? So the galaxy we picked has a very exciting name, M83. And this is what it looks like through a telescope. And it has a slightly more friendly name called the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. So it's a close barred spiral galaxy. And when I say close, I still mean 50 million light years away, so not that close. But if you look at this image, you can see this central kind of flat region. That's a bar. And then you see this spiral coming out here. So it's kind of got some interesting morphology where you've got three different regions. We've got a bar region, we've got some spiral arms, and then we've got kind of stuff that's not in the bar and not in the spiral. Oh yeah, who's this? And this galaxy is actually visible with a good pair of binoculars if you know where to look. So, this is 
going to be our simulation model. The code we use is called ENSO. It's one of the big astrophysics codes for building things like galaxies. And we can see, well, eventually, that this will end up looking vaguely like a galaxy. It starts off with a very, just a simple flat disk. But then slowly, as the gas evolves, let's just skip that. We end up with a bar region and these two spiral arms, which is what we're looking for. So our bar region is anything around here. So anything that looks like a cloud and is in this region is a bar cloud. If it's in this region and it's one of these dense clouds, it's a spiral cloud. And if it's out here, we say it's not in the spiral and it's not in the disk, it's kind of a country cloud. <coughs> So we can zoom in a bit, and you can just get a feel for how the data really looks. So this is a close-in, and each of these red or green or blue dots is an individual cloud. And we can zoom in again. And really, the thing to take away is this is pretty messy. There's a lot of interactions going on. It's kind of hard to see where one cloud starts and where one ends. It's just this big mess of dense and less dense gas. So how do we know whether this looks anything like clouds that are observed in different galaxies? This is the point I'm going to have to resort to some graphs. So it turns out if you observe these star <coughs> cloud nurseries in galaxies, there is this relation, where this is the cloud mass and this is the cloud radius. So if you plot this, put your mass here and your radius here. So radius increases, our clouds just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then on this axis, our clouds get heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And it kind of makes sense. What I'm saying is, if you're big and fat, then you're also going to have a big size. So more mass, big cloud. And if you have a small mass, well, you're probably going to have a small size too. So it's a logical relation. And we expect the result to look something like this white line. So every cloud should have a point somewhere around here. So let's find out if it does in our simulated galaxy. These are the disk clouds. So these are my ultimate country clouds. They're not in a spiral. They're not in the bar. They don't form many stars. And they lie oh, roughly along this line, not bad. You know, bigger radius is going to give you a bigger mass, OK? But there is something very slightly strange with this result, and one I was not expecting. So much so that I made poor Yusuke go back and redo this plot at least three times before I believed it. And my question was, there seems to be two types of cloud. There's these guys, and there's these guys. And there's a gap between them on the plot. There's some kind of no man's land where no cloud would dare live with that radius and mass bang on this line. So why have we got two types of cloud? This wasn't really what I was expecting. These are all country disk clouds. So why do they come in two different types? So let's move on and look at the spiral clouds. So these are the guys that are lurking in this arm region here. And here, the two types are even more strongly marked than before. There's a top group, and there's this bottom group. Right? And this was very confusing, because before, uh, maybe it was just a few points down there. I could ignore them, experimental error. But here, no. There's a serious collection of clouds down here, and a serious collection of clouds up here. It's very hard to ignore the fact that there's a split. What about the bar? So the bar here is my middle region, and this gets even more sinister. I seem to have three types. I've got this type one, I've got this type two, but then there's this other gap where no one dares exist. I have this type 3 cloud. So in the bar, I have three types of cloud. And in the spiral and disk, I have two, two cloud types. 
and I just don't know why. So, this is what they all look like together, and there's quite clearly two trends here, and then the bar clouds seem to split and have a, a patch up here and then another patch down here. So, it seems that there are different types of clouds, but not divided between the regions as I expected. I thought maybe all the green clouds would be of one type, and all the blue clouds of another. But instead, I see different types, but they're in all my different areas of my galaxy. So, one way to do this is just to recategorize these clouds. Currently, blue is this disk outer country region, spiral is my town, and then bar is this inner city region. But instead, I'm going to split them like this. Anything in this region is a type 1, anything down here is a type 2, and anything here is a type 3. Now my type 1 clouds, these are my most typical cloud. In all regions of the galaxy, from the far out country extremes in the disk to my deep inner city, they are the most common type of cloud you will find. And these are a pretty good match with observations. Their mass is about what we observe, their radius is about what we observe. You know, pretty good average clouds that agree well with telescope observations. The type 2 are much smaller, so their mass is right down here. So for the same radius, they have a lower mass, which means they're kind of diffuse. So it's like going from a bowling ball to a snowball. Like the mass is just lower and it's more fluffy. And my type 3, these are my T-Rex clouds. They are seriously big and massive. And they live right up here. So I'm going to refer to them after Tyrannosaurus rex as being the biggest clouds in my galaxy. So, what we can actually do is just take a really close look at the galaxy and find out what's going on. So this is my inner city bar region here. And what we see, first of all, is it is packed full of clouds. If you were walking down a street in this region, it would be like bumping into people all the time. There are just, every single number here is a cloud. So you couldn't turn around with that, oh, I'm not a cloud. And what we're seeing is actually the evidence of a lot of collisions. Like walking down a really crowded street, you're just going to keep bumping into people. And we know this because of these tidal features. This is like gas being ripped off the cloud, and you end up with a kind of streamer as a result. So these kind of strands are signatures of a collision or close encounter. And as a result, when you have a lot of collisions, you get some seriously big, fat clouds because they're merging all the time with smaller clouds. And then these form these tidal interactions. So the bigger and fatter you get, the more gas you can start to pull off people. It's like your gravity is so large that even from this distance, I could rip your scarf off or your coat. This is what tidal interactions are. And in these small tidal tails, which is like an interaction where a coat or a scarf has been pulled off a neighboring cloud, we get these really small type 2 clouds. So these diffuse snowball clouds over here are being formed in these tidal interactions. Now what about the spiral region? Well, the spiral region is still a city. There's a lot of clouds going on there. But there are less clouds than in the inner city bar region. But there are more clouds than in the countryside disk area of the galaxy. This means we're getting less of these massive type 3 T-Rex clouds. Because we've got less clouds and therefore less mergers. But still more than in the country disk. And therefore, because we've got less of these T-Rex clouds, we've got less of this tidal stripping, and so we have less type 2 really small snowball clouds. 
But again, more than the disc, the spiral is this in-between area. So although all three areas have these three cloud types, the proportion, so the number of these cloud types they have, is different between regions. In the really hustle and bustle of our inner city bar region, we have a lot of really massive clouds and really small clouds. Whereas in the outer disk region, we have mainly our typical chilling type 2 clouds. So how do we take this information and answer why do we see spiral arms? Well, in the spiral and the bar regions, there are many of these star nursery clouds. And this is giving us a very high collision count to make these massive clouds and these small ones. And this leads to these three different cloud types. So this is the main difference. The bar and spiral region have this process going on where we end up with much more really large and really small cloud types due to the collisions. But does that really explain why there's more stars? I've proved, I hope, that it's a good reason for having different types of cloud, but not that this necessarily gives you stars. So can this interaction zone, this busy, bustling street, also give you a high star formation rate? That's not so clear. But if cloud collisions could cause star formation, that explains why we see so many more stars in the spiral region. So I had to move to different students for this one. These are two of my master's students, also very regretful at posing for me for the camera. Uh, this is Shiva-san and this is Takahiro-san. And they look specifically at what happens when two of these gas cloud nurseries smack each other. So the question is, can cloud collisions make stars? So apart from the question I've just asked about why we see spiral arms, this question about cloud collisions has another importance regarding really big stars. So as I mentioned at the beginning, inside these gas nurseries, gravity can make these really dense regions. And eventually, they get so dense and so compact, you start to fuse and you get a star. For our sun, no problem. This is exactly what happens. We're pretty happy with it. But what we find is as this dense region gets bigger and bigger, it's going to get hotter. And eventually, this heat starts pushing back on the gas around it. So this means no more gas can fall onto this dense region, and it stops growing. So we end up with a maximum star size, where its heat eventually stops its growth. And that's all very well, except that the maximum star size we get is smaller than the biggest stars in our galaxy. So how on earth did we get really, really big stars? Because this system, which we thought we understood, says that the maximum star size you can get is smaller than the biggest object we see. So how are these really big guys being born? The idea that it might be cloud collisions came from some observations. This is the NAM-10-2 telescope. It's somewhere in Chile, in South America. And they have seen some observations where there is a truckload of star formation going on in this region. And there seems to be two clouds coming together at quite fast speeds. So they've observed two of these star-forming clouds they appear to be on a collision course, and where they're meeting, there is a super star cluster, where a huge number of stars are made in a very small space, including some really, really big ones. So, does that mean that this is the answer, and can a cloud collision produce a big star? Well, here's our simulation, cloud one, cloud two, and we're going to take the small cloud and smash it into the big cloud. 
And as they collide, we end up with really dense gas, which in this picture is this blue jagged line running between the clouds. So basically, the clouds come together. During the collision, everything is getting compressed. So we end up with a shock front of super dense gas. Isn't so unlike two cars running together and getting this dense, scrumpled metal in the middle. So if this really dense gas can collapse really fast, maybe it can form a really big star before it has a chance to heat up and stop that collapse. So the question is, do we get balls that are dense enough and big enough to collapse into a really big star before their heat stops their growth? Oh, here's our collision. So the clouds have just met there, and then we push harder and harder and harder, and we get a lot of dense gas here. So this looks pretty dense. Blue isn't dense. Yellow and green is kind of average density. And then red is when we really get started on producing this dense gas. And certainly compared to the clouds at first, we have produced some really dense regions that look promising. But are they enough to make really big stars? Well, here's a graph. So this is mass, measured in the mass of the sun. So here's one solar mass. And this is a thousand times our mass. And this is time running on the bottom. So the red line is the minimum mass we need to form a star. If we are below that line, no star. And this, actually the black and the blue line, depending on how you measure it, is the mass of our dense gas. And indeed, we see that over here, we have definitely exceeded <coughs> the minimum mass needed to make a star. So we should be able to collapse down and fall up. So this suggests cloud collisions really can make these stars, which is important because it might just solve our big star problem. But it will also take us back to this question of why we see spiral arms. So as we said, we've discovered there are many, many star-forming clouds in the spiral. These have a lot of interactions, like walking down a busy street, and they're bumping and knocking into each other all the time. Now this meant we saw different cloud types with some super big clouds from all the mergers, and some little diddly ones from these tidal interactions. And what we've also shown is that such interactions can actually produce stars, really quite big ones. So it can be very important for our galaxy star formation rate. So that was the work on galaxies and stars. Basically, spirals are shiny, lots of stars. Possible reason for a lot of stars is these collisions between star forming clouds. So once we're done with galaxies and stars, what is next? Well, galaxy star, kind of the next logical step, would be a planet. So this is an area I've just got interested in recently. And you might ask, well, how do you form a planet? Now, you'll all be very surprised to know that the starting point for this is one of these clouds of gas. So this is exactly the same cloud of gas in which stars are born, they also mark our entry point into planet formation. So with a cloud of gas, two things are going on. There's two physical processes. The first is the one we've already seen. It's going to collapse. So gravity is going to pull it down, we get a dense region, and we get a star. But it's also doing something else, and that is it's spinning. It's almost, well, I'm going to come right out here and say it's impossible to have a cloud that doesn't have some spin. There's just too many interactions going on in the universe, and spin is a conserved quantity. You always keep it. So therefore, as we collapse, we're also going to be spinning around. 
and the spin, like being on a roundabout, stops you falling inwards. You're going to feel a force outwards. So that means while some gas, boom, forms a star, some of the gas is going to form a disc from the spinning. So the end result is a star and what we call a protoplanetary disc. So a disc of dust and gas encircling that star. And this is the birthplace for the planets. And every single star is going to have one of these discs around it, which strongly suggests planets are immensely common in the universe. So, this month actually, I think, I'm going to say December, this month is a bit too recent, but this was an observation of one of these disks, and it was done by the new radio telescope ALMA. Now ALMA has been promised to astronomers for a long time. In fact, in the last conferences I've attended in the last five years, any problem, galaxies, stars, planets, have ended with, well, when we get ALMA, this will be solved. So ALMA has made some pretty big promises, but it's going to solve whatever you're worried about. But actually, this image is incredible, so it might just deliver. And what it is, is a planet forming disk around the young star HL Tauri, which is in the middle here. And it's about 450 light years away, so not exactly local. But these dark rings are very interesting. They might, might be where planets are forming. And the reason there's a lot of uncertainty is that they are exactly what we expect from a planet, a large planet. When a planet gets to roughly 10 times the size of the Earth, so we're heading for Jupiter, when it starts to build up, it basically eats everything around it in the disk. And it's going around the circle, gathering gas. So these dark rings are basically gaps where these massive planets exist. And as they get big, they actually start to push the gas away from them. So you have a hole. So this is exactly what we expect for a newly forming planet. But the disk is really young. It's too young to have massive planets by normal formation theory. So what's going on? Is it that we're wrong and planet formation is much, much faster than we thought? Or is it that these rings can be caused by something else than a very large planet? And we don't know yet. We still don't have the data from this image. It's being released to the science community sometime this month. So, how do we actually go from this disk to a planet? Well, we start off with gas and lots of tiny dust grains. I mean, these are like micrometer in size. So really, the dust you have on your kitchen floor is pretty capable of building a planet, if you had enough of it. <laughs> so we start off with really tiny bits of dust, and they start to stick together. So you get a dust bunny. And these just get bigger and bigger, and bigger and bigger. And eventually, when we get to around a kilometer in size, gravity starts to take an interest. And once gravity gets involved, we can get a round shape. So eventually, gravity will start making sure this stuff all stays together. And we have proof of this. This is the Itakawa asteroid. Most of the asteroids live in between, the, in between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. And Heiobasa 1, which is one of Japan's missions, <coughs> went out and landed actually on this asteroid. It took a lot of photos and it did a sample retrieval mission where it gathered dust and brought it back to Earth. And what it saw was a rubble pile lots of small pieces stuck together. And this tells you that this idea for planet formation is correct. We start off with something small and we're sticking. And when we see asteroids that are obviously made up of lots of small pieces, we know we've got that bit right. Now interestingly, Heobasa, 
It was the first of two missions, and Hayabusa 2 launched on December 12th at the end of last year. And it's going to investigate a different asteroid, particularly with the question of what brought water to Earth. Because it might have come actually from the asteroids. In fact, it probably did. So, once we have something big enough that gravity grudgingly agrees to take an interest in the formation process, it can pull it into a round shape. And that's the point we start thinking more like a planet than an asteroid or a rock. So that sounds pretty straightforward. You get small dust, you build it up, bigger, 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 boom, planet, great, done. Not quite. There are some problems. So, when the planet is forming into a round object, there's still a lot of gas left around the star. And this gives the planet some problems. The planet and the gas disk start pulling on one another. It's like feeling a drag force as you run through a high wind. And this drag force starts to pull the planet towards the star, which is rather unfortunate since stars are very hot and we don't really want to end up crashing into one. And in fact, this process can happen so fast, it's very surprising that our planet did not run into the sun. So one of the questions is, how do we stop this process? How do we stop all planets ending up in the sun? Now we know this drag process definitely happens. It was actually first proposed in the 1980s. And people went, huh, no, 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 it, that can't happen. Because clearly, the Earth is not in the sun, and we have lots of planets much further out. So this migration process it's a miscalculation. It doesn't really happen in reality. Then, we found a whole load of exoplanets. Starting in 1995, our universe is filled with discovered planets outside our solar system. At a conference at the start of this year, the Kepler Space Telescope announced its 1,000th confirmed planet outside our solar system. That brings the total number to almost 2,000 confirmed exoplanets, and a further 4,000 possible exoplanets. Now, interestingly, a whole bunch of those exoplanets, including the first one we ever found, are Jupiter-sized and really, really close to their star. So they have drifted inwards. They cannot have formed that close to their star. It's impossible. They must have formed, like our Jupiter, much further out in their solar system and moved inwards. But somehow, they stopped. Now, why did they stop? And that's going to be the subject of future computer simulations. So I'm afraid I have absolutely no answer to this rather critical question, other than please keep calm and watch the space. So a final note I'd just like to touch on and ask, can we build a master, one ring to rule them all simulation? Could we have one that modeled our galaxy and the stars and the planets, the whole universe, down to us? And the answer, rather disappointingly, is no. But why? And the problem is one of size and scale. So a galaxy, like ours, is this many meters across pretty big. But a sun, a star, is only 1,400 million meters across, which is a lot smaller than the galaxy. Saturn, which is already a pretty big planet, is 120 million meters. And our Earth is a mere 12 million meters across. And this means, in a computer simulation, it's really hard to model both galaxies and planets. It's like if you're looking at artwork. If you stand back, you can see the whole picture. But if you want to see the detail, you've got to walk up close, but then you can't see the edges anymore. So in my simulations of a galaxy, for instance, the smallest object I can see is a star group 
which is over a thousand stars in size. I can't see anything smaller. So if I want to model planets, the largest thing I could see would be an individual star, but I couldn't see the whole galaxy. I have to pick what scale I'm going to work at. So in conclusion, <coughs> computer simulations let us explore the physics of the universe. And our group, the results I presented, have found that spiral arms in galaxies have many collisions between these star-forming clouds. And these can create stars, including really massive stars. Now, because this is recent research, it's hard to know how important this is. I would say I'm completely sure it, is, it plays a role in galaxy star formation, and it is important. But I don't think I would go as far as saying all stars are formed in cloud collisions. Merely that cloud collisions are playing a factor. They are important. And the next step is finding what stops planets from running into the sun. Thank you very much.